what I wanted to talk about today is um, thinking about reflexive work and thinking about how reflexive work can help us understand data, particularly data which are embodied and sensed and um, effective, um, and how we might undertake this kind of reflexive work, and whether it's possible to make it available um, to others. Um, I mean, a word, of, first of all, about why one might want to do this and why it was important in the project that I'm going to talk about today. Um, we kind of started from the kind of very common point that researchers are part of the social worlds that they investigate. And they're also how others come to know those worlds. They're the kind of instruments of knowing in um, Janet Hunt's kind of evocative and... Uh, sort of chilling phrase as well. So qualitative data, are, are, we felt, were co-created by the researcher and the research subject through what the researcher thinks to ask, what she hears, what she doesn't hear, and through what she feels. Um, so I want to kind of talk about working with others to share these data, these kind of reflexive data about, that, that are intangible, so sharing the data, but also kind of working with others to make sense of the data. In particular, um, working with others to make sense of data that are hard for you to hear. Um, either because, um, for example, it's something you take for granted and don't notice, or possibly because the data engage your own experiences um, in ways that are uncomfortable to recognise. And so clearly there are ethical risks and... Um, just risks in attempting to do this sort of work with, with, with researchers' subjectivity, so to attempting to work instrumentally. And I want to kind of touch on that in conclusion, if time lets me. Um, so these are kind of about these research relationships that Karen was talking about, the kind of research relationship in which data are generated with the interviewee, and also the research relationships that help you make sense of, of that data. And I want to talk about these in the context of a psychosocial narrative um, project on first-time motherhood, which I um, did with Wendy Holway and Phoenix and, and with Cathy Irwin. Um, um, so I want to talk about the design of this project in a bit of detail and the kind of reflexive work that sort of flowed from that. And then look at a data fragment and kind of sort of moment by moment and, and think about um, how this illustrates sort of reflexivity in practice. So, um, so the, our main research question was how do women experience becoming a mother and in particular what are the kind of embodied, taken for granted and unconscious aspects of maternal subjectivities. So we had a sample of 18 um, mothers, um, and we did three interviews with each of them during their first year of motherhood. Um, we also did weekly uh, observations with six of the sample, um, and that work was led by Cathy Irwin, and unfortunately I'm just not going to have time to talk about that today. I'm going to focus on the interviews. So the interviews were kind of intensive, longitudinal work, so the narratives didn't just unfold in one interview, they unfolded over the whole fieldwork period in the interviews, in the phone calls to arrange interviews and cancel interviews in emails and in chance encounters in the street. So it's intensive and kind of over, over, over the year period. And all the interviews took place in Tower Hamlets. Um, and we, that borough was chosen because it's an ethnically and socially diverse borough and, and the sample reflected that. Um, and Tower Hamlets is also my home. Um, I lived there at the time of the research, and I still do. And my children were born there just um, shortly before the children of the women we interviewed. So a core part of this reflexive task for me was working out how my maternal identity was implicated in the analysis we did, and when my kind of local knowledge was a resource, and, and when it kind of led to blind spots. Um, 
And another part of that task was disentangling my own experience from that of the mothers I interviewed, and importantly, from the literature that I read. Um, and of course, I'm, I'm far from alone in doing research this close to home. Many of us are drawn to research topics. We have a personal stake in. Um, and I think it's particularly pertinent for early career researchers and for PhD candidates who will tend to do more field work than, um, more, than more senior colleagues and who are often um, less familiar with, less engaged with the, the literature and the theoretical frameworks, which can act as a sort of buffer between one's own experience and, and, and the experience of, um, uh, of one's interviewees. Okay. Um, so, the, yeah, so the, the issues never go away, but I think they're particularly pertinent to, this, to the early career researchers. So we used a free association narrative method, which was developed by Wendy and Tony Jefferson, um, which involves thinking about how narratives convey information and content, but also how they are performative and relational and effective. And one of the ways we kind of made these aspects of the work visible was paying attention to the flow of narrative, um, to, th to think about the associations that researchers and interviewees made between ideas and also kind of looking at the um, ruptures in narratives, um, to looking at the silences, kind of slips of the tongue, um, and apparent non sequiturs. And I'll, I'll talk through that in the data example later. So our concept of um, maternal subjectivities was relational and dynamic. And we needed to find a way of doing reflexive work that went beyond what Stephen Frosch has called the honest gaze of the researcher, the kind of stating of identity positions um, um, in relation to the research subject as regards class or age or whether you're a mother or not, and, and looking at how to, kind of, to, to mobilize um, these, these positions. Um, so I want to move on to talk about how we did this. So after each interview, we wrote field notes, which um, recorded thick descriptions of the research setting and also recorded our own subjective responses. And these were records for the team uh, to work with. These were early analysis. And the act of writing was occasionally a way of containing intense and difficult feelings, which came across, which came out, which came up during the interviews. And we used these alongside audio and transcript data for group data analysis within the research team and uh, beyond the research team with others. And working in, in a group was a really, really productive in terms of generating richer interpretations than we, than we could have come up with on our own, and also ideas about the material. Um, it was also um, really useful for working with material which, which was, was difficult or painful. Um, to do that in a group um, rather than alone. Um, and it did bring a freshness to the way we thought about our data. And there was the, the kind of aspect that I'm, I'm talking about today about noticing things that researchers were possibly too close to the material to see or which, which were uncomfortable. Um, in addition to this, um, I, as, um, the, as the researcher on the project, had around 10 supervision sessions with Joe Ryan, who, um, was a who is a researcher, a very experienced researcher, and who is a psychoanalyst. And um, psychoanalysis was one of the theoretical resources um, for the project as a whole, but um, not straightforwardly for, for this supervision work. So these weren't analysis sessions or counselling sessions, um, but they did draw on kind of psycho psychoanalytical practices, um, in particular, um, uh, sort of allowing oneself to kind of engage with the other while maintaining a, 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 a reflective distance. But really importantly, this space in the middle of the project was confidential. So reflexive work can be really exposing. Um, and however flat and open the research team you're working with is, um, there are aspects of that autobiographical experience that I didn't want to bring to, into that workplace. And so Jill was someone to think with, actually, to think with about the data 
and about how the data engaged my own maternal subjectivity and what aspects of this were useful and what could be set to one side. Um, so I want to move quickly on to the little data fragment I've brought and to kind of show how I notice myself in an interview, um, I come to notice myself in an interview through this process of thinking with others. Um, I want to look at the case of Sarah, who was the only mother out of our 18 who returned to work full time after having her first baby. And this issue of how women combined motherhood and paid um, work was one of our research questions, and it was also one that, that I was um, personally taxed by at the time. My own childcare arrangements always felt rather patched together and precarious. And it was an issue that wasn't just on my mind, it was, a, it was part of the cultural conversation at that, at that point in time, in the, in the mid-noughties. Um, there were novels, there were newspaper articles, there were policy statements, there was a war, a mommy war between stay-at-home mothers and, um, and working mothers. Um, so kind of very polarised um, debate in the ether um, at the moment when the interview with Sarah took place. And Sarah herself, after a bruising first few months, had settled back fairly smoothly into work. She made time for a daily run and a lunch break. Her daughter was happy with her local childminder. And Sarah tells me about this. Um, and she mentions <coughs> that her daughter has cried only once to date. And then she goes on to talk about how the child loves being with the other children, etc., etc. But I pull her back to the crying. And I ask her, um, I ask her um, to tell me, can you tell me about the time she did cry? Did it stick in your memory at all? And she says, truthfully, no. And then we'll skip. She spends a long time saying no. Um, we'll skip to the second part of what she said. Um, she says, I heard her cry as I walked away, but I thought, oh, maybe... If you drop something, if she's holding a toy and she drops it, she cries because she really wants everything there. She cries when she drops things and something like dropping a toy on the floor or she'll do it herself, she'll drop it herself and then she'll cry after it to remind you, pick it up for me please. And I say, right. And Sarah says, to me, and I'm not going to worry about that. I mean, that's just, I can't really, you know, if you're going to, and I say, yeah. And when I listen back to this with Joe, and I, when I listen back to this and then I discuss it with Joe as part of the analysis of this case, I can hear Sarah telling me about a baby who knows that things which disappear come back. So a dropped toy is retrieved, a mother who leaves returns. And Sarah describes how she knows how the child is okay when she goes because of the close attention that she pays when she's there. But what I hear initially and take in in a much more personal way is that a working mother just has to get on with it and cannot worry. And the analysis that I start to build in my field note is of a compartmentalised and a boundaried kind of mothering. And honestly, my tone is rather sceptical and tart. But then Sarah goes on to say something which drags me out of listening and into a conversation. And she says, sounds like a hard mum, doesn't it? And I'm, no, not at all, not at all, no. And Sarah goes on, it wasn't really obvious that she's crying because I actually left her. And I say, yes, yes, I see exactly what you mean. That's very interesting. And you mentioned your boss wasn't particular. You didn't feel particularly that he was child friendly. So I understand her question as a request for reassurance, which I rushed to offer. And then I shut down this line of questioning, which seems to have become awkward and charged for both of us. But Sarah's question makes me wonder if I have conveyed to her that I might have judged her to be a hard mum. And then I wonder that I have, if I have. So this little is a bit of a rupture, a kind of clumsiness that I'm tempted to gloss over. But when I talk about it in supervision um, with Joe. <coughs> I can see how Sarah's answer touches on my own feelings about organising childcare. 
And I characterise my own arrangements as messier and much more conflicted than Sarah's, but somehow better. Um, and I kind of other and push away the smoothness that I hear in her account of mothering. But when I kind of make explicit the contrast that I am drawing between us, I'm able to kind of pull back a bit from caricaturing her in this way and notice the ambiguities and the accommodations which are blindingly obvious, um, really, in her account. And this is a kind of tiny moment in the hours and hours and hours of data we have and, and you know, that would build up in a longitudinal project. But actually, it's, it's really useful, and it's kind of a, it changes things slightly for me. Um, because in Les Back's words, it, it sort of um, helps me to hold my own account in its place and avoid falling back on what I think I know um, and listen. And to conclude very quickly, um, this small encounter shows how um, interviews get under our skin and um, how they stay there. Um, and in that sense, most qualitative research is longitudinal and carries on long after um, the project finishes and long after they stop paying you. Um, and good writes about this kind of residue of data which can attach to contract researchers leaving projects. Um, and she says, Jackie Good, she says, um, in a paper in Sociological Research Online, she says, the researcher can become a repository for different kinds of data to those which she perhaps to those which she perhaps anticipated collecting. More often than not, they are held by the researcher and carried away to the next project or else reflected on in something of a vacuum. So this points to the value um, of being able to reflect not in a vacuum, but with others, with Joe, with the research team. And kind of finally, it, it shows up the, sort of, the tensions between the careful, in-depth, reflexive work I was able to do and I've described, which depends on time and also depends on open, trust-based working relationships, which also depend on times, Karen was just saying. And the kind of research culture we find ourselves in in the UK, which is built upon short-term contractors. <laughs>